So I want to start talking about undirected probabilistic graphical models. known under various names, uh, one, of the, one of them being Markov random fields. And they are known under various names because they have been invented and reinvented multiple times because it's somehow a deep concept at the interface of graph theory, um, statistics, probability theory. And I want to give you the following example of where this can be useful. Um, the picture here is uh, from a, a paper uh, which is a few years old, I think it's 2005 or so, um, from the lab of Christoph Schnur. And the problem they were looking at is this. Um, you're given some medical scan and the task is uh, to label all the spines. So in their formulation of the problem, they actually um, try to find discrete positions for each uh, vertebra or the area between the vertebrae here. Um, so they would associate a single point or a single coordinate um, with each segment. Um, for simplicity now, I will assume that uh, we want the output segmentation uh, to be um, how many vertebrae do we have? I don't know. Uh, 20 is not the correct number, but I'm using 20 for now. Okay. So I'm assuming um, that the correct output would be something like this. Um, you know, for all background pixels, uh, like for all the pixels that I'm marking here, which are not a vertebra, um, the correct label. Uh, should be, uh, let's say, zero. And here in vertebra number, uh, so, so they were looking at the interstitial space between the vertebra, but let's ignore that, okay? Let's use vertebra instead. Let's say here in this region, the correct label would have been seven because it's number seven. Uh, actually, it's not huh, because there are different types of vertebra. Oh my, too much biology for me here. So let's say this here, the correct label would be number one. Here, the correct label would be number two. There, oh, I've not been hitting the vertebra at all. <laughs> okay, let's do this again. Uh, here would be number one. There would be number two. Um, this should be labeled as number three. This should be labeled as number four. That should be labeled as number five, and so on. Uh, down to, uh, let's say, this one should be number 19. Because I want to do with 20, I want to have just 20 labels, let's say. Okay, so I could ask that at the end of the process, um, I want each pixel to have one out of 20 different values. If the value is zero, my understanding that this is not a vertebra at all. And otherwise, if the label is one, two, three, and so on up to 19, that should be the number of such and such vertebra. And you know, why is this useful at all? Um, well, it makes sense in a medical pipeline, let's say. Okay, so, so for example, there are ideas that um, you take uh, the victim of an accident from a car accident, you bring the person in into the emergency room, you put the person in the CT scanner and within seconds you get the whole body scan and you get a complete parsing of the person into uh, muscles and bones and heart and liver and so on and then the computer should uh, highlight by itself 
uh, which bones are broken and uh, you know what has been torn and, and so on. Yeah? So, so to automatically parse the body uh, for its healthy part and the damaged parts. Okay, so let's say that uh, this here would be, you know, some baby step towards that pipeline, which, you know, somehow makes sense. Okay, so uh, how do we go about it? Um, a natural way seems to be to train a classifier or a matched filter or however you want to call it, which uh, reacts strongly or has a big amplitude for uh, vertebra number one and a different classifier which has a big response um, for vertebra uh, number two. And let me just, uh, indeed this one here, the next sample image is for number two. And down here counting from the top, this is number for number 17 and for some other uh, vertebra. So um, as you can see, the classifier here for vertebra number 17, it reacts strongly to the correct number 17. Let's assume it's this one, but it also reacts fairly strongly to neighboring vertebra. Okay. Um, so in other words, we could train 20 different classifiers if we have 20 classes. Um, we could let each classifier make uh, a set of predictions, one for each pixel. Then we, we end up with uh, 20 pictures like the ones you see on the right hand side. And then, well, we would take the winning entry for each pixel. Yeah? So the classifier that shouts strongest in a given pixel wins that pixel. That would be the answer. Okay, so that would be the sort of the, the baseline, yeah? the order zero method that you could develop. And well, I think the, the problems are obvious, uh, namely, if the classifier is imperfect, you see it has strong responses in all kinds of places here. And maybe, so hopefully it wins where it should win, but maybe this classifier also wins somewhere where it should not win. And you know that will be a bad prediction somehow. So how could we inject prior knowledge into this pipeline? Any suggestions? We already know the spatial relation between our vertebrates. Mm -hmm. We know that 16 is next to 17 and also next to 15. Yeah, great. So um, let's say I could have an interaction matrix. Um, so for vertebra number 16, um, we could say uh, 16 next to 16 is okay. Uh, OK means I give it a penalty of 0. Um, 16 next to 17 would be mostly OK. I give it a penalty of 1. 16 next to 15 is mostly OK. I give it a penalty of 1. But 16 next to 18 should not happen. So I give this a penalty of infinity. And uh, similarly for the others. So. Um, what you suggest is a tri-diagonal matrix which has a penalty of zero along the diagonal. If I here have the classes from zero, uh, class zero is special, right? So class zero we should treat separately. But for the others, um, to have a pixel next to a pixel of the same label should give us a cost of zero. Uh, a pixel next to an adjacent label should have some cost. I here call it cost one. The reason I do it is because we don't want a super noisy boundary. Huh? Even between 16 and 17, we don't want sort of single pixel outliers within the wrong class. 
and we could give a penalty of infinity outside. Uh, and what you suggest for class zero? Yeah. Where? Zero there and one next to all others. Great. Okay. And we make this matrix symmetric. And um, that I think looks like a good strategy to me. Yeah. Um, so we have somehow expressed our prior knowledge of the problem, namely that we know that there's a spatial ordering of these vertebra. We've somehow put this into a matrix. And somehow, somehow, you know, implicitly, we said that this uh, penalties here, that they relate to adjacent pixels. All of this was correct. And let's now, um, you know, generalize this a little bit or, or put it in more in abstract framework. Um, so more generally speaking, um, let's say, well, let me show it on this picture here. Uh, let's say we have, we want to infer a probability of an output set of labels Z given an input X. And according to Bayes' theorem, this is proportional to probability of X given Z times P of Z. So by the way, in this entire course, usually when I'm writing a small letter here, this means it's a whole vector. In this case, the vector represents an entire image which has been vectorized. So this is an input image. This here would be the output label image. And what we have, this relation here, is a Bayes theorem. And now all of these um, things in Bayes' theorem have names. Yeah? So the thing on the, on the left-hand side um, is called the posterior probability of a label image given the input image X. So this, in words, is said given. And this is a conditional probability. And if you don't know about conditional probabilities, and if you don't know about Bayes' theorem and so on, you should read up on it. Okay, this is just a reminder here. Um, then on the right-hand side, um, this term here is called the likelihood. So if I assume a given label image, what is the probability of an observed image X? And uh, this here, is called the prior. Prior for prior assumption, in German vorherige Annahme, uh, concerning the distribution of our random variables z. Yeah? And overall, uh, so all of these are here considered as random variables. Okay, now um, this posterior probability, um, this is wanted, or more specifically, what we want is the output that has the largest prob posterior probability given the input. So the output, let's say z hat, which has the largest posterior probability given input x. And given the model parameters, which I've not written down this time. So in formula here, I can write that I'm looking for a z hat, which is the arc max of this posterior here. And this has a special name. Um, this is called the map solution. MAP is an abbreviation 
it means the maximum a posteriori solution. It has an abbreviation because this is a quantity which we so often are looking for. Okay, now can you speculate or argue you know, the images on the left-hand side, how they relate to the formula on the right-hand side. So let's start, you know, with the obvious, with the big gray value image on the left. It's the input X, okay? Um, what about these other things? You know, these somehow matched filter responses or detector responses. Um, is could be probability that what that yeah um, yes um, so the way you said it in words this sounded like um, the posterior um, but here we have not yet used, you know, this prior knowledge that we know about the sequence of things. Huh? So, and, uh, and, okay, can somebody else say something? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Different solutions for D? Yeah, so we have different pictures for different Zs, but you know these solutions obviously, or, or these cannot be, if we take this as prior information, then the thing on the left-hand side cannot really be the solutions because they don't respect the order relation that we have been discussing. So that doesn't leave so many possibilities now. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So um, this is how we will interpret it here. Okay. Uh, if we want to bring together the formula on the right hand side with the pictures on the left hand side. So I will, um, I, I'm stressing this is how we interpret them. Not, I'm not saying this is what they are, because in fact, uh, a naive or, or simple discriminative classifier was trained to make these predictions. Uh, but for our purposes here, I will pretend that these are the likelihoods. Huh? So I will say that uh, this is the pixel wise the pixel-wise likelihood that uh, pixel L arises from ZL equals, what, what class was this? One. And uh, this one here I will interpret as the probability that or the likelihood of pixel L having been generated by Z L equals two and so on. Okay, so I, I can use these as likelihoods uh, 
in this formula. And so let's say that the thing on the left hand side, this is what's wanted. Um, this here we have more or less given in terms of these images. Let me put this in quotation marks. And the prior, we have just figured out a prior. Uh, let's say after some scratching of our heads, we've made a good suggestion here. This is also given. Uh, and then given the stuff on the right hand side, I can find uh, with some effort the most likely posterior solution. I can find the left hand side. And by the way, um, because we maximize here, so if I write down the base theorem in, in, in full, here I wrote is proportional to. Like I can also write it out explicitly. Yeah? This is this divided by p of x. But p of x does not depend on z, and hence I don't need it in this maximization process. Which is why this maximum a posteriori solution is so, is so popular, because I do not need the denominator. Uh, so I don't need the partition function of this entire system here. Fine. So, you know, let's look at this in more abstract term. You came up with a great energy function here. Um, but let's look at this in, in more generality. Yeah. Um, Let's say possible priors for an image or for a label image Z with, let's say, uh, one million pixels. So if I do this naively, or the most general formulation, mm, okay, let me write most generally. If I want to have a table which assigns a probability to all possible output label images, um, this table will need a lot of entries. Can you um, tell me how many entries this table will have? Let me call this a probability table. If I can have 20 classes, yeah? so let's say n equals 10 to the 6 pixels, and k equals 20 possible classes. How many entries will this probability table have? So I want to give each possible label image a separate prior probability, depending on how good I think this looks, without having looked at the patient at all. Just what is a good constellation of vertebra, what is a bad constellation of vertebra labels. Um, it is 20 to the power of uh, 1 million because each pixel can have 20 different labels and I don't have just, uh, well, and for all of them I need to multiply these. So this is the number of possible labels. Everybody agrees? Is this correct? I think it's right. Yeah, so this is the number of possible label images. And um, so, you know, to write it as a, um, so ignoring this factor of two, yeah, let's say um, this is uh, roughly 10 to the power of one 
million possible images. Um, and this is a lot more than the 10 to the power of 81 or so uh, particles that we have in the visible universe. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a fantastic number. Okay, so certainly it's not a, not a table that we would want to compute or derive or anything explicitly. Yeah? Um, so the next best thing we can do is um, make these interactions more local. So if I say, for example, I consider only pairwise interactions, I can still have um, different pairwise interactions in principle between each pair of pixels. So um, first of all, how many pairs of pixels do I have? I have uh, 10 to the 6 pixels and almost each one has a neighbor to the right and almost each one has a neighbor to the bottom. So that means I have twice this number in terms of pixel-pixel neighborhoods. And then, well, I could have 20 possible labels for the first pixel and 20 possible labels for the other pixel. And so overall I get something like 10 to the nine parameters. That is something we can start working with. Yeah, it's still, uh, you know, this is just uh, a gigabyte of numbers. Uh, so depending on our precision with which we present these numbers, that's not completely unfeasible anymore. For the next simplification, I can now, and that's what you suggested initially a few minutes ago, was to make these interactions all the same. Yeah? So I can say I'm using homogeneous pairwise interactions. In this case, I need a table with uh, 20 times 20 numbers. That would be 400. Or we can simplify further. Um, if we just take this matrix with the you know, tri-diagonal structure, uh, so let me call this uniform interactions. You know, uniform, homogeneous, pairwise interactions, uh, uniform, homogeneous, pairwise interactions, um, then I'm left with something like, well, essentially one parameter, huh? namely how much I penalize. Um, so if I give infinity to classes which are not allowed to be next to each other, uh, and I give some constant number to allowed label transitions. And well, this is, you know, that looks completely doable. Um, it turns out that even if we use such a simple prior, just, you know, this uh, tri-diagonal matrix, as a prior, and if we use the kind of likelihood images on the left, then solving the maximum a posteriori, uh, finding the maximum a posteriori solution is still an NPH problem. Uh, it becomes solvable in polynomial time only in the special case when we have just two classes, not 20 classes. But for 20 classes, um, there are, or for more than two classes, there are good approximate solvers. So they're not guaranteed to give us the globally optimal solution, 
but they may find it or um, they may find a solution which in terms of energy is not too far from the global optimum. Okay, and so what I've tried to say here is that um, when we want to code our prior assumptions of what an image looks like, it makes sense to really use uh, just local interactions because here we have this huge reduction in complexity from uh, 10 to the 1 million parameters to 10 to the 9 parameters. So here we exploit local interactions only. And I said earlier on uh, that you know, this uh, family of techniques is also called a Markov random field. And when you hear the name Markov, it already implies that we have some kind of, uh, you know, that we have a Markov blanket and such that we have some kind of neighborhood <coughs> in which uh, uh, immediate interactions are being felt. So just you know, as a quick summary of what we've uh, what we've seen here, or the conclusion is uh, local models or excuse me, energy functions that are a composition of local terms allow for a tractable representation of prior knowledge and this prior knowledge can either be coded by hand uh, like we've done here by inventing this table or it can of course be learned from data. Any questions so far? The green box in the left picture here, or uh, oh, the box on the right. One. This one. Okay, um, so in, I gave, I tried to draw what a good example solution should look like um, by assigning to each, in the left image, yeah, by assigning to each pixel a specific class. And uh, you say, but here I've assigned hard numbers and not probabilities. Yeah? And uh, the fact that it's hard assignments um, comes from this arc max here. Yeah? So I'm looking um, for the labeling Z, which has the highest probability. So, you know, if you want me to write this more carefully, um, statisticians, uh, they make a distinction between random variables and realizations. Yeah? So I could ask, um, 
if I have a capital random variable, if I have a random variable capital Z, and I have realizations small z, and now this is given that uh, I have observed uh, an image small x, and then the arc max here is over all possible realizations of this random variable. So, uh, in other words, here in the likelihood, um, this is not crisp. Yeah? So, uh, a given pixel may have different probabilities uh, under different classes. And uh, this thing here uh, need also not be crisp. Uh, but if afterwards I look for the most probable solution in the posterior sense, then this is going to be one particular label for each pixel. It could be that my maximum is degenerate so that there are two solutions which have the same probability, same posterior probability or same energy. Um, that could happen. Uh, I'm ignoring now this thing when I'm saying we get out a unique solution for each pixel. But ask again, or maybe somebody else can ask more questions about this to address this point, so that I understand it better. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So let's say that um, the real matrix is this times you know, wherever I've written one, I could have written parameter theta and um, the thing is if we make this uh, parameter theta very big then we will get very uh, simple solutions between two vertebra so let me try and show this on a pixel grid um, for example Let's say if I have a vertebra number five, 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 six, 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 the penalty of this configuration here is three, yeah, because I have three transitions. If you consider this, So here the, the, the energy that I found here was three, and the energy in this case is ah also three. Uh, I tried, no, wrong, five, yeah? One, two, three, four, five, okay. So um, if I make this, so this is, here the energy is three theta, and here the energy is five theta. So what you see, if I make theta very large, then it will uh, make transitions between classes very unlikely. In the extreme case, if I make theta extremely large, then it would just label everything in terms of a single label, because that way it gets zero penalty from the prior. It would override the likelihood. On the other hand, if I switch theta off completely, or if I set it to zero, then I would expect very noisy solutions because these likelihoods here are very noisy. So somewhere in between is a good compromise. And learning is all about finding a compromise which does well on average on your training set. Was that your question? If not, it was a good question, but uh, what's your question? Uh, I mean, like the likelihood we, uh, is to be predicted by the maps that we make. Ah, the likelihood, okay. Um, so... I mean, this map is related to the likelihood. I mean, it is to be even... No, so this, matri so this matrix here was the prior, okay? I understand, for example, that if uh, you have... Uh, 
Mm, I don't get it yet. So what we... So let's say, so these images, these images here were referring to likelihood, yeah? So let's, let's say that we have um, one pixel, which would be equally likely to be a vertebra 17 or 18, yeah? uh, according to the likelihood, then our prior would help us decide, you know, by looking at the neighborhood, and this is an optimization across the whole image, which of these is then more compatible with our prior assumption or which is more likely. Um, okay, let, you know, come to me again after the hour and ask the same question again, and I will try and answer it again. Um, there are, as far as I know, people coming in here at 3.30, so we should end on time.